Today's participants are Terry Fine, and Peter Delphia. We join their conversation in the faculty lounge. Holly means many. Mm -hmm. Ticks mean blood-sucking insects. <laughs> so I said, but if you replace the blood with the money, that's people's view of Congress. Right. It, and it's true. I mean, it, 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 it sobers them up as fast as it did you right mm -hmm. now. Right. That people, they go, oh, that's funny, but yeah. I said, well, replace the blood with money. Right. And that's the problem is that we, we look at, people have a very negative view of politics. I ask in my classes, who plans to run for office someday? I mean, maybe we'll get one person to raise their hand in a group of 90. They'll say, are you planning? I'll say, no. Right. I'm eligible. Right? I'm well over 35, so right. I'm eligible to run for any office that there is. I was born in the U.S., and right. I've lived in the U.S. my whole life. And the only, the oldest that you have to be for any office that has an age requirement is president, right. and that's 35. Right. So I'm eligible to run for anything. Right or to be anything, and I have no interest either. And so, so tell me why, why, as a political scientist, I think you would have such a good grasp in terms of what it would take to be a good politician. Yeah. Uh, and and I, after reading your bio, I know you, you are truly um, enthusiastic about participating in political activities within the community. Mm -hmm. I think you would be an absolute perfect person to run for politics. Tell me why you either would or would not, and, and what are some of your, your thinking, your thoughts about that? Well, I, th I think that it just, it's just, to me, even to me, it's very ugly and very difficult. And the mm -hmm. process of getting elected is very difficult and very time consuming. And it's, it's so invasive. Mm -hmm. It's so invasive to think that by me, my decision to run for office, any record I have, I mean, I don't have a criminal record, but any, any family history, any financial records that I have, that all becomes public knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that means that other people become affected by those revelations. Right. And that, to me, is, is I have a very negative view about that. Right. Um, I also, you know, I, I look and I admire people who can work in groups. I mean, one of the realities about any legislative process, you have to get a majority to get anything done. So people have to come together. And I think, oh, well, what if I'm not getting my way? You know, how would I handle that? So I think that part of it is, is this, is, is even myself, I look at, at people most of whom are good and honorable people. Mm -hmm. But just like a drop of poison will, will poison the entire gallon of water, mm -hmm. I look at those, some of those negatives and, and I have sort of a negative view about the process sure. in that way. But just to, just to get back to the other question, sort of what is the science part of it? Science is that systematic look mm -hmm. um, to, to, to be able to create a systematic look at things so that we can explain and predict political phenomena. So that's ultimately what we want to do. We want to get a grasp on government and the factors that affect government, and, but to do it in a systematic way. Mm -hmm. So many people don't consider political science a science. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the first two weeks of my research methods classes is spent talking about, well, what is the scientific method? What are our challenges when we're looking at human behavior, when we're trying to, to use the scientific method? And what opportunities do we have to overcome some of them? Of mm -hmm. course, not all, but some of them. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the classes that you teach. I'm sure you're, you've uh, been in your position at UCF for 17 years. You've seen a lot of growth. You have a lot of experience. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in mm -hmm. politics. Tell me about some of the classes that you teach and how you may bring some of the things that we see out in, in the political arena today and how you bring that into the classroom. Well, I originally was hired to teach American politics with a specialty in political behavior, which would be public opinion and political parties in my case. Some people also study voting in elections, which I do some work in that, but mm -hmm. that's what I was originally hired to do. And after about six or seven years here, mm -hmm. other people were hired who could also do those things. And then there were certain gaps in the curriculum that were going to happen unless I filled them. Mm -hmm. So for example, my former chair was asked to take on an administrative role due to an unplanned resignation. Mm -hmm. And she was scheduled to teach women in politics. Mm -hmm. Well, the only reason I had ever taught women in politics before was when I was at getting my doctorate at the University of Connecticut and mm -hmm. I was offered this opportunity to teach women in politics mm -hmm. and I'd never taught it before. It had never been taught at the University of Connecticut, which was a hundred year old institution at the time. Mm -hmm. And I, 
I needed the money, so I put the course together. Mm -hmm. I found a gap in that literature, which became my dissertation topic, so I really benefited from that, right. truthfully benefited. Yeah. But she was scheduled to teach women in politics, and then she took on this administrative role all of a sudden, so either I taught it or it didn't get offered. Right. So that was one, one gap that I could fill. And then one night, um, I don't remember, maybe five, six years ago, a student asked a question ab about women whole in Congress or something. And it took me 30 minutes to answer the question. And I realized that women in politics is really an inappropriate course to be offering. We really needed two courses. We needed a course on women in public policy, mm -hmm. which looked at how anything from education, employment, reproduction, contraception, criminal justice, how those policies affected women. And then also looking at women in the political arena, mm -hmm. which is women in Congress, women candidates, women judges, women um, uh, uh, mayors in other kinds of roles and in their campaigns and how they vote. And so just from that one question, mm -hmm. I, we now have two women in politics courses that focus on American politics. One we call women in public policy, which I teach, yes. and then one women in political behavior, which I also teach. Mm -hmm. And now we've also added a course that I don't teach on women in globalization, mm -hmm. and then we also have a women in comparative politics class. Mm -hmm. Then um, about a year after that, um, one of my colleagues got a, an administrative job at another university, mm -hmm. and he had created the course on politics and civil rights. Mm -hmm. And my first publication was looking at race differences in public opinion towards equal opportunity issues. And I never saw, saw myself as a civil rights person, but I thought, how could, how could, we, not, how could we consider ourselves a legitimate department right. if we didn't offer a course on politics and civil rights? Right. So I said, well, I better pick that up. Right. So I picked it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so now I don't teach political parties anymore. I don't teach public opinion anymore. I teach civil rights. I teach women in public policy. I teach women in political behavior. Um, all sort of linked to other faculties' decision making and then my own research background. Now, what do I bring, which is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. I've been to six national presidential nominating conventions, yeah. uh, three Republican, three Democrat. Those have not only brought great stories, but they've also brought great um, research opportunities. Um, the first research that I did after getting here was linked to um, something that I just happened to see when I was at the Republican National Convention in 1988 in New Orleans. Um, from there, I also uh, bring my experience. I'm a poll worker, mm -hmm. and I bring my experience as a poll worker in terms of talking about um, not only what voters know or don't know, which is sort of anecdotal, but also how public policies affect voters. Uh, back in 2004, for example, I was a poll worker at a polling place near the university. And we had so many students come in that day who were told they couldn't vote. Why couldn't they vote? It turns out that we, that Bill Clinton signed into law in 1993 the National Voter Reg Registration right. Act. Mm -hmm. Its nickname is Motor Voter. Mm -hmm. Its nickname is Motor Voter. And all these students who, when they moved to the area, got their driver's license address updated, made the assumption that once they did that, their voter registration would also be moved. Right. So they were turned away because they never registered a to change vote. of address. I see, yeah. And as a result, they couldn't vote. So here we have a real life example. I'm, I can tell you what motor voter is about. I can tell you what Clinton's motivation was for it. I can sure. tell you about what happened in Congress. Sure. But look at what happened to that person right. who could have been you. Right. And so I bring um, those kinds of experiences. I also, um, I'm also on the Orange County Voter Education Alliance, right. which is an organization committed to educating voters to new policies. We also volunteer uh, at registration. I've, I've sat more than, more than once I've spent an afternoon at the YMCA sitting at the voter registration table. I've gone to churches, gone to synagogues, talking about the value of, of uh, voter participation and, and voter registration. Mm -hmm. And back in 2004, what I also started to do was I also um, go on to Spanish language radio. Hmm. That's and you might appreciate this being mm -hmm. from Queens. All right, sure. Um, that there's a large Puerto Rican population mm -hmm. uh, in Florida, as there yes. is in New York, and they're full, full U.S. citizens. Mm -hmm. 
But because uh, Puerto Rico is not a state, right. and the 23rd Amendment gives D.C. the right to vote in presidential elections, but not Puerto Rico, right. not Guam, not the right. U.S. Virgin Islands, that when they came, uh, so many of them who moved to this area in the early 21st century, so to speak, went to vote in the 2004 presidential primary and they were turned away because they were registered as independents. I see, yeah. Florida is a close primary state. Right. And so this woman um, called our department, desperate for somebody to just come on the air to explain the, the, the legal benefit of being registered with a party. It meant you could participate in Florida, otherwise you can't in a primary, in a nomination contest, to explain what districts were. Um, it just so happens that these, uh, so many of these individuals were living in Orlando. They were Orlando, Florida, 328, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But they were not living in the city of Orlando. Mm. And there was a mayor's race on the same day as the presidential preference primary. Nice. They thought they lived in the city of Orlando, but they lived in unincorporated Orange County with an Orlando mailing address. Mm. So just for somebody to come on the air and to explain what districts were about mm -hmm. what registration gave you yeah. um, and particularly for other people who were from for, who were naturalized citizens but for, from other Latin American countries where being registered with a political party might bring harm to your family sure they registered as independents I see. and then there were also consequences there I don't speak a word of Spanish mm -hmm. maybe five mm -hmm. so the the interviewer translated everything I said and every question that came in and every answer I gave. Mm -hmm. And I also went back on the air this year as well. Oh, that's great. Let so. me ask, I, there are so many, so many exciting questions and things I'd like to, to learn. I mean, I know you work uh, closely with the community um, and you talked about your aspirations or, or non-aspirations <laughs> of being within the political arena. Let me ask you this. Uh, it, it seemed to me many years ago that, that there was this possibility of of you know the normal person to be able to become involved in politics, but you know as as you uh, scientifically broke down the word politics, you know the many blood sucking <laughs> insects. Uh, but again, replacing blood with money, it seems now that that uh, the ability for someone to really win in politics that there seems to be so much money that needs to be involved, mm -hmm. and and as a result. Uh, a person which has a, 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 a good-hearted vision and perspective for his community, you know, may not be able to garner the brand name recognition or visibility that someone with a lot of money, which can either put signs all over the place or get himself on TV or whatever it is, that the, the normal guy just doesn't have a chance anymore. You mm -hmm. know, amplify that a little bit. Tell me what, what your thoughts are and what's going on. Well, I mean, to me, that's very troubling, the idea that signs would make a difference even on a, on a bigger scale. That, that why would knowing somebody's name? I would. I mean, Peter Delphiet is a name, but it's Peter <laughs> Delphiet, the person that would, that is to me would be more important. But we don't have a system that allows me to know more about you than your name. Yeah. And part of that is because of the cost involved. Through our income tax, we are asked right after we're asked our address and social security number. Do you want to spend? Do you want to give three dollars of your taxes to the presidential campaign fund? Now that doesn't mean that you pay three dollars more in tax. As many people have that perception, it just means three dollars of what you already owe. Right. And that money only goes to the presidential campaign fund, and that's used to ad address some of these issues. But it doesn't address any other race. Congress, mayors, governors; those are all completely privately funded. And so it does concern me that that people are only that only about 30 percent actually give their three three dollars mm -hmm. but and I so, sometimes I ask my students well why don't we just have con congressional elections publicly paid for there are some elements of the law which do encourage at least contact with voters mm -hmm. it sounds kind of well of course it's about contact with voters uh, so for example if a presidential candidate is running in the primary that if that person raises uh, $5,000 worth of donations, $250 or less, then, the, then that $3, part of that fund goes to matching. That's what we call matching funds. So that at least encourages candidates to not spend all their time talking to people who can give more than $250, because if it's more than $250, it doesn't get matched. Mm -hmm. Only up to $250 gets matched. So it encourages them to talk to more people of a more diverse economic backgrounds, which is, to me is very encouraging. Um, at the same time, 
it is very troubling to me when I think about that the enormous cost involved because there are so there are so many points of view that bring value to political decision making that just simply go unheard. Mm -hmm. I have a personal policy that if a former student of mine is running for office, I always give them money. All right. That's but those are the only ones who ever get money <laughs> from me. That's my policy, and I, I do. I go online. Sure. I, try, I go online and I see who's running for offices, and if I recognize a name, sure. I send them a check. They don't even have Great. to ask. Good. Good. Sometimes good. they do, but I just. Good. That's good. Try to send them in to encourage if my students are actually doing what they learned how to do. Yeah. It's it's worth uh, it's worth uh, helping out. So when they say, "Well, are you a Democrat?" I say, "Well, I give money to Democrats. I give money to Republicans. I give money to Independents. As long as they're as in my class, there you go. They they get money from me." Let me ask you I, in your in your um, bio, you, uh, you talked about some of the classes that you taught, but mm -hmm. uh, I think it was with respect to your research. You said it had an, an emphasis on. Um, Political communication, right. and there was another another phrase political that was political behavior. Political behavior. Yeah. Let me let me ask ask you this. Um, obviously, um, um, we've had we have presidents and politicians which have a variety of styles. Some which are more polished than others. Uh, um, tell me what your perspective is, or, or what you tell your students when we have a. Uh, an extremely visible, visible political <laughs> leader who is extremely unpolished, or or doesn't seem to communicate well, or well, how does that rub you in, in any way? Believe it or not, Peter, that is working to somebody's advantage today. Uh, until <laughs> and it worked, it will work to his advantage until January fourth, two thousand seven. I'm talking about the Speaker of the House, Dennis Hastert. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dennis Hastert, who's from Chicago area, he became a Speaker of the House through a really an an un on a very surreal set of circumstances, this was back in the late 90s, that Newt Gingrich was Speaker of the House, and right. he's very polished. Right. He has a PhD, he's right. very polished. And in the midterm election that year, the Democrats gained five seats. Mm -hmm. So what's typical is, is that the, Newt Gingrich said, this is all my fault, I'm going to leave now so that I'll take all the blame. Right. Then Bob Livingston from the New Orleans area, he was scheduled to become the Speaker of the House. And then the Democrats got mad at him because that was at the same time that they were impeaching Clinton or yes. going through the process. Right. The impeachment actually vote took place December of 98 to give you, so it was about six weeks after that election. Mm -hmm. So between the time that Gingrich said he was leaving and Livingston was the speaker designate and the Democrats were mad because they were impeaching Clinton, the Republicans were impeaching Clinton, so they did some background research and Livingston had had an affair. Mm -hmm. So... He, on the day of the <laughs> impeachment vote, Livingston said, I'm resigning. So he resigned from Congress, resigned from the speakership, which hadn't yet been his because the new Congress isn't installed till January. So it was like three weeks away. And Mr. President, you should take my lead. Mm -hmm. So there are the Republicans with the majority in the House of Representatives. So they picked Dennis Hastert. Mm -hmm. Who, if you ever looked at him, nobody would ever want to have an affair with Dennis <laughs> Hastert. <laughs> They call him Congressman Rumpel because he mm -hmm. never irons his pants. Right. Uh -huh. Okay, so mm -hmm. he was a real safe bet because, you know, because he filled a need for right. the Republicans at that he time. He can't have skeletons in his closet. No, <laughs> you look at him, right. you know right. that he has, he has no skeletons in his closet. But at the same time, the, the fact that people would take a position, a person of that position, a Congress member, and dare to call him anything but Congressman right. also tells us how our culture has just gotten so focused on appearance, yeah. on polish. Right. Um, sometimes I'll, I'll think, well, you know, I'll say, well, not only could Abraham Lincoln never become president today because he wasn't that attractive, but, I mean, by today's standards, sure. I'm sure Mary thought he was gorgeous. Sure. His wife Mary <laughs> thought he was gorgeous. But, mm -hmm. um, but this idea that particularly in the media age, has had such, I mean, when they say that it is the fourth branch of government, they're not kidding because mm -hmm. the presence of the media has so altered how we look at not only people who have power, but people who should have power. Yeah. And, and it really it has had such an impact. We think about Franklin Roosevelt and mm -hmm. how he never allowed himself to be um, filmed in a in a wheelchair they always had to be he was seated in a chair right. but we would see him swimming right. and when he would do his whistle stops that two people would be 
you know, standing on either side, on either side right. so that gravity wouldn't bring him to the sure, ground. Sure, absolutely. And that, to me, uh, on the one hand, that has really narrowed right. a, a, the eligibility pool. Right. But also because of the civil rights movement, it has broadened it that Hispanics and African Americans and women, just being in those categories, mm -hmm. if a person sees you, they'll say, oh, you're, I, I expect that you will work for X group mm -hmm. by being a member of the group. And right. we know that that's not always true. There are Republicans right. and Democrats in, among all, both genders, among all races, among all ethnicities. Um, so on the one hand, the media has sort of narrowed things, but they've also broadened because now we know more about candidates in ways that, that matter to people. Yeah, you, you mentioned that the media is now the fourth branch of the government. It, it is pretty interesting to note that um, um, a politician's appearance and in, and in terms of what he believes in is primarily broadcast through the public mm -hmm. through media. Mm -hmm. And media has this ability to, to tweak that to, to, you know, they can play with the facts but tweak it in a way that could totally change the context. I, w I was reading a book recently and it was about a particular senator, you know, no names involved, but um, it turns out that he was running for office and his uh, opponent, it turns out that the opponent's son, um, I think was actually killed in a, in a carjacking. And so the uh, opponent had actually started uh, a bill on a gun regulation within the state. Okay. And so it turns out when this, this uh, uh, bill was going to be passed within the state, the, the other guy, who was, they were both state, uh, state legislative people, uh, he had to go visit his ailing mother, you know, you know out, of the, out of the state. And, and so he was there taking care of his mom, and he was still there when the vote was being cast. And it turns out that the vote did not make it. And so, and then, then there was this whole concept that the media was going to show uh, this ad where this other guy is there vacationing, sipping <laughs> a, a cocktail while, you know, this gun ban legislation is not, not being pushed through. So you have one guy who's really trying to take care of uh, an important family issue, and so he couldn't be there for the vote, but then the media p potentially showing it in a way which, again, using the facts, but twisting it in a way which is not quite totally fair. Rather oh. interesting the way the media is, be has become the fourth part of the, the, the government in some sense. Well, you, you talk about twisting, but another element that is, is also a grave concern, that's a qualitative element, but the quantitative element, mm -hmm. that because of the competition among stations, especially now with cable, that it's very important to get the information out there and to get to the next story. Mm -hmm. So when Nixon was running for president in 72, the average soundbite, which is sort of the amount of time that a person could talk and the media would, would actually broadcast that part, was 32 seconds. Mm. And now it's down to nine. Mm. And, that, and so think about how much information can you transmit in nine seconds. Right. And so that's, where I, that's why we have these, these slogans, you know, read my lips, no new taxes, Willie Horton, right. um, I'm, uh, I you know, so-and-so is against the Pledge of Allegiance, right. well, you know, because course, that's what you can get whatever. into, what was that? <laughs> stay the course. Yeah, stay <laughs> the course, right. <laughs> that's you can get into nine <laughs> seconds. And so that's part of it, too, is that the, the media, because they're a private industry, it's not, I don't think it's um, in any way uh, it, it, spiteful, per se. I think it's just that they're a private industry mm -hmm. and protected by the First Amendment, and therefore they have to think about their own competitive circumstances when they're doing their what their job is. Right. But as a result, the, the, not only the quality, but the quantity of information has really been severely affected mm -hmm. by these factors, by the rise of cable, by, their pr by just the sheer presence of the media. You know, they say, uh, when I was taking social psychology 25 years ago, um, my professor even said, even a cockroach acts differently when the cockroach knows it's being watched. <laughs> That's know? true. It does. Well, it really I, does. I, I wrote it down and I remembered yeah, it. Yeah, really um, and so, well, how would, why would human beings be any different? Yes. Let me ask. Um, we, we talked about the, the potential of, let's say, uh, uh, big industry providing big um, uh, financial contributions mm -hmm. to politicians yeah. to, to help them uh, vote a particular way, let's say, on any type of legislative uh, issues that come up. Um, what is your feeling about that, let's say, if, if some uh, industries can't get to particular politicians, then by these big industries providing money to, to news, news media or cable TV or mm -hmm. newspapers to to um, 
present issues in a particular way. Do you think that, that tends to, to tarnish the way uh, the general person is able to absorb the information? I think there's all kinds of things that, that influence how people can get information and how they, what they do with that information. Mm -hmm. But I think that um, part, of, part of the concern is, is that because campaigns do cost so much money and then the media is sort of the biggest budget item, that that so much influences how a campaign goes and inc influences the competitive environment. And it's really kind of interesting because if we just compare ourselves to other countries, that the same criteria that President Bush mandated in Afghanistan, in Iraq, that he mandated in the early 21st century when he was arguing for a two-state solution in the Middle East between Palestine and Israel, the same criteria for how a democratic election has to go mm -hmm. do not apply in the United States. Mm. Compe they don't have to be competitive, but both candidates have to have a reasonable chance of winning. That's what President Bush mandated if, they were, if those entities, those countries were going to get support mm -hmm. from the United States. I see. They have to be competitive, so you couldn't just put up a puppet for one side and right. a big icon for the other. So they had to be competitive. They had to be, um, have a reasonable chance of winning. There had to be um, opportunities for participation, for full participation. In the United States, we have elections on Tuesdays. We have the federal law that uh, Nixon signed it in the early 70s that polling places had to be open a minimum of 12 hours a day. Mm -hmm. But 12 hours doesn't address people who work 12-hour shifts, right. such as nurses, for ex is one example. Um, so there's all kinds of barriers to participation and barriers. Mm -hmm.